day, according to TransLink. These buses aren't moving anywhere. Yeah. Many years have passed since Metro Vancouver last experienced a transit strike, 18 to be precise. Fast forward to 2019 and transit takers could soon be yelling the same chant. Well, I won't be able to move. I'll stay at home. Well, I can't drive now because I can't see properly, eh? So I, I gave my uh, vehicle to my son. And seniors wouldn't be the only ones affected. That would be really hard for us, like people who are going for UBC, the schools. But the union, which represents more than 5,000 workers at TransLink, including bus drivers, C-bus employees, and maintenance staff in Metro Vancouver, got a 99% vote last night in favor of a strike mandate. The problem, according to drivers, is safety. A significant increase in ridership has, they say, eroded working conditions. Basically, increase in ridership, uh, it's, uh, it's up by 18% and we don't have enough time to do our job safely and properly. TransLink, meanwhile, says since 2016, it's added an 18% increase in bus service hours, including more service to 30 of its 50 most overcrowded routes. It's also hired 1,000 new operators over the last two years, with an additional 1,300 more expected by 2021. Our aged population out there, uh, lots of wheelchairs, lots of, uh, you know, babies in strollers. Union members would also like a wage increase. TransLink isn't commenting at this time, but says it doesn't anticipate any disruption to service. That will not happen here. Yeah. The 2001 Vancouver transit strike lasted four months, with drivers eventually forced back to work by the provincial government. Eighteen years later, and this strike mandate will remain in effect for 90 days, with the union saying it will provide 72 hours notice of any strike action. Negotiations are scheduled to begin again on October 15th. Deborah Goebel, CBC News, Vancouver. Conservative Party leader Andrew Scheer was in BC today unveiling his party's fiscal platform. He's promising tax cuts and spending on new programs, but says he will balance the budget by finding new revenue streams and looking for ways to save money elsewhere including slowing down infrastructure spending, something he says is not a cut. The overall dollar amount is the exact same. There's no reduction in the overall dollar amount. What we're saying is that we are going to make sure that projects actually get built, and that's what the Liberal government has failed to do. He's pledging to spend the same $187 billion as the Liberals, but over 15 years instead of 12. That means less money per year will be spent on infrastructure projects, something that could have an impact on transportation projects here in the Lower Mainland. And here to talk about this more is our municipal affairs reporter, Justin McElroy. So, Justin, if the Conservatives were to form the next government and extend the timeline of that infrastructure spending, what might that mean for projects uh, here in Metro Vancouver? That's a big question for people because there are so many projects that people are talking about these days. But when you look at the Conservative platform, you get a bit of a hint because in there, there's a page where it says what Andrew Shear's priorities would be. And one of them laid out on the board says they would ensure that they would fund the George Massey tunnel replacement. So they talk about that, but there's two other big projects that people are talking about these days. That is the extension of the SkyTrain line all the way from um, Arbutus and then to UBC, as well as all the way to Langley. Currently, there's only money in place for those to go to Fleetwood and the Fraser Valley and Arbutus in Vancouver. So whether those would get built in the same timeline or at all with this extension of the money, something that's really unclear at this time. So any concerns from municipal leaders about this tonight, Justin? Uh, well, I spoke to Jonathan Cote. He's the mayor of New Westminster, but he's also the chair of the TransLink Mayor's Council, which oversees TransLink and all of its spending priorities. And he was pretty blunt about what this could mean for those big SkyTrain extension projects. Have a listen. You know, I think the Conservative platform is, uh, is a bit disappointing. I think uh, having cuts to infrastructure investment into, into cities uh, is, is a bit short-sighted. Uh, uh, I think particularly in, in Metro Vancouver, uh, if we're thinking about uh, uh, major projects like SkyTrain to Langrie or SkyTrain to UBC, uh, you know, this type of platform ultimately is going to put those projects uh, at risk and, and may, uh, may delay them indefinitely. 
So there you have it. Uh, municipal leaders in Metro Vancouver have been relatively quiet during this campaign so far, but that might pick up now that all the platforms are in place. Told that Kennedy Stewart, Mayor of Vancouver, might have more to say about all this later next week. I look forward to that. Thanks very much, Justin. Thanks, Mike. Well, campaign signs are, of course, a visible hallmark during elections, but not this year in Surrey. That's because election signs are now banned on public property. As Joel Ballard reports, it's forcing candidates to get creative. Things are a little different for Liberal candidate Randeep Sarai this election season. If I had it my way, I would allow uh, street signs um, on public property. Uh. But he can't. In May, Surrey City Council voted in favour of a bylaw banning election signs on public property. During the city's last civic election cycle, signs filled every corner. Yes, so many of the signs were a safety concern at our intersections. Uh. Now, without being able to rely on signs, Sarai and other candidates are being forced to try new strategies. Hey, nowadays, uh, uh, the, most, the best platform to meet is through social media, Facebook, Instagram, uh, WhatsApp, uh, different ethnic uh, platforms. Uh, so those are more ways to connect with people and uh, you just kind of keep pushing your message and, and sharing it uh, and hope that people are listening and watching. Driving through Surrey, you might forget you're in the middle of an election. There are barely any signs to be seen, and Sarai thinks council went too far. Uh, I would just have it enforced a bit heavier uh, for those that are violating uh, uh, or obstructing uh, vis visibility uh, area, visible areas for traffic. However, some candidates find it a breath of fresh air. You know, we don't have a vast amount of resources like the other parties do. Uh, so it kind of levels the playing field in some way because I don't have to compete with all of these, you know, signs being put up everywhere, but yeah. Instead, Waring is doubling down on tried and true tactics like media ads and good old fashioned door knocking. The campaign manager for the conservative candidate in the Surrey Newton riding admits the bylaw has made for a steep learning curve. Uh, when it comes to name recognition uh, as well, that's the challenge is without the signs, people don't know who's running. For this campaign, he's made sure that a lot of the marketing materials also include his candidate's picture, giving people a chance to connect the face to the name. But this political scientist thinks the new bylaw is a bigger deal to candidates than to voters. Uh, voters tend to make their minds up. Uh, either they have their opinion set or they maybe make up their mind at, at the last week or so. Uh, so this could hurt some of the candidates uh, in terms of lower visibility. He says voter habits are changing, especially younger generations who are using alternative outlets for their election information. And that's where candidates should focus their energy. Joel Ballard, CBC News, Surrey. And voters are heading to polling stations already as advance voting started today. Anyone eligible to vote can attend the station designated on their voting card all weekend. Advanced polling ends Monday, October 14th. Election day, of course, October 21st. Well, a prominent member of Vancouver Island's mountain biking community has died after suffering a head injury while riding in Mexico. Jordi Lunn was known around the world for building and riding jumps that pushed the limit of his sport. Lunn grew up in Parksville, where he started riding BMX as a child. Eventually, he discovered mountain biking and went on to compete internationally, earning a reputation as among the most daring in the sport. You first see him and he's a big muscular guy with a shaved head or weird haircut with tattoos all over his body, but he's the most gentle and soft-spoken and kind person. He definitely sort of paved the way to uh, a type of, of style of sport that we're seeing today. Lund was also known for building mountain biking trails with family and friends around Vancouver Island some of which are used for mountain biking festivals every year. An RCMP officer is recovering from a gunshot wound tonight and a suspect is in custody after an overnight standoff in southeastern BC. It happened near Argenta, north of Caslow. Police are carrying out an arrest warrant near the community of around 100 when the 28-year-old suspect allegedly barricaded himself inside a cabin and fired shots. An officer was taken to hospital with serious but non-life-threatening injuries. RCMP say after lengthy negotiations, they captured the suspect without incident. The injured officer is expected to recover. A man has been charged with second-degree murder in connection with a death last month in Vancouver's West End. 
23-year-old Yasin Rashid was arrested September 11th. His murder charge comes after 29-year-old Kyle Vincent Gabriel died in hospital after an altercation at a youth mental health facility at 1125 Pendrel Street. Gabriel's death marked Vancouver's seventh homicide of the year. Well, the end is in sight for one of the oldest operating gondolas in B.C. Grouse Mountain says it's looking for a more modern system to replace the old Blue Skyride aerial tram, which has been operating since the 60s. It once ferried guests, but is now used by staff for service and maintenance. The resort says there are no immediate changes planned, but they say they are exploring their options. The wife of an Iranian-Canadian professor who died in an Iranian jail has been reunited with her sons in Vancouver. They came together for the first time in 18 months last night at YBR after being separated trying to reach Canada. <laughs> Miriam Mombini's sons have fought for more than a year to make this reunion happen. Amid widespread controversy surrounding her husband's death, the family tried to leave Iran last March, fearing for their safety. But Mombini was detained at Tehran's airport and told her sons to continue on. They say they're thankful to Iran for finally allowing their mother to join them now and to the Canadian government for its support. weekend is here, the long weekend, I guess, and uh, so is Brett. What, what are we looking for? Well, I think it is going to be a not-too-shabby weekend. I know over these past couple of days, we've really been treated to some beautiful weather conditions, lots of sunshine, and even today, it was definitely the warmest it's been in a few days. We didn't break any records this morning for the cold, but it was a little bit chilly first thing this morning. But as I said, lots of sunshine throughout the day, and that helped keep those temperatures very close to seasonal. Vancouver Harbour got up to about 13 degrees today, and down toward the airport, it was only about 12. And presently, our temperatures haven't really budged a lot from that region, though of course toward the valley it is definitely warmer, much closer to seasonal there. In terms of our satellite and radar, what we're going to start to see over the next little while is the return of that cloud cover. We've had nothing but clear skies really for the past three days and throughout the overnight tonight we're going to see that cloud start to build in a little bit more in earnest and that's going to actually help us in some ways. If you weren't a fan of those chilly nights, tonight is going to be much warmer by comparison. We're looking at lows going down to maybe eight or nine degrees or so and a sneak peek at what you can be expecting for tomorrow as part of our weekend forecast, well, it's going to be pretty on close to seasonal. Now, when I come back in the next segment, I'll give you your full and complete Thanksgiving weather forecast. Talk to you then. Thanks, Brett. You're welcome. Well, hereditary chiefs of the New Kalk Nation stood under a pole carved more than 100 years ago and asked the Royal British Columbia Museum today to repatriate it to its rightful place near Bella Coola. It marks the beginning of a return of several items the museum has held for many years. Tells the story of our um, of our family, our our Smai Yusta, and um, it's important. I'm hoping to bring our grandfather's spirit back home to where it has come from. It'll mean a lot to us uh, because um, spiritually, you know, it's um, it's important that um, our people and our families and our the people that have passed on are are able to go and to continue their journey and their um, and their at life after death. Eh? We as a people are restoring our ancestral ways through a variety of endeavors and we are preparing for the return of a new cock property held by the museums. I recognize as the leader of this museum that this pole needs to return back to its territory, that these treasures need to return back to their territories. And I'm delighted to assist you in the return of this magnificent pole by Louis Snow. What happens next is we'll be working with the community, first of all, to set a timeline. That's the most important because we have the work internally that we have to do, which is to make sure that we have all the documentation related to this pole and any of the other treasures that the community is interested in. Uh, the facilities people to uh, figure out how we now take this down safely 
We want to be as careful as we can so that there's no damage, of course, to the pole in that process. And as you can imagine, the process to remove the totems is expected to be a slow and delicate one, so there's no final timeline on when they will be removed. Just a reminder, you can watch this newscast and other CBC programs wherever you go on CBC Gem. If you haven't already, be sure to download the app. It's free. And CBC Vancouver is also on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. Well, we heard about their pledge on infrastructure spending earlier. Coming up, the rest of what's being promised by the Conservatives. And thanks for being with us uh, online during the three-minute TV commercial break. This uh, isn't the first time Metro Vancouver has dealt with a potential bus strike, and it's not the first our Deborah Goebel has covered either. We're doing a little flashback this Friday, taking you back 19 years when Deb took a look at the impact the last strike had in 2001. A lot of time has passed since 1984, but when it comes to bus strikes, not much has changed. Okay, so this is where we're going to be picking up John here, ready to set lights. Ordinarily, Kelly and John would be meeting up on a North Van bus. Hang on to this and I'll just pull the seat forward. Oops, careful. Don't kill yourself. But this morning, along with a soon-to-be-picked-up third bus buddy, they will be heading downtown on the first weekday of the transit strike. Hello, Rebecca. This is their impromptu carpool. Not much different than what folks were doing during the transit strike of 1984. At City Hall, a phone-in carpool service tries to match riders with drivers. Only problem is, for every driver who's willing to share his car, there are 15 people who want a lift. That means a lot are just plain out of luck. 70th and Granville, one person seeking carpool to Hastings and Granville, or as close to as possible. And things aren't much different today. The Sun and Province have offered free carpool ads, and the drivees are far outnumbering the drivers. We're heading west, going towards Second Arrows Bridge, and there's probably about 12 to 13 cars ahead of us, but there's no major lineups anywhere. Could be all those former bus-taking ride-seekers just stayed home. Drivers anticipating commuter chaos this morning were greeted instead with an unusually light rush hour. We left a little bit earlier today, didn't we? 6.30. 6.30, preparing for the worst. Right. 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 So maybe we should try 7 tomorrow, guys, and see what happens. Back in the carpool, Kelly, John, and Rebecca have reached downtown Vancouver in record time. Perfect. The parking lot has space, and the rates are reasonable. Although back in 84, as the strike went on, lots not only got full, lot owners chose to jack up the prices. It certainly seems we're about to experience many of the same problems as we did in 1984. But there is one thing that has changed significantly. 17 years ago, 290,000 of us were taking the bus every week. Today, more than 600,000 people depend on the Lower Mainland's transit system. Deborah Goble, CBC News, Vancouver. We made it. And Deb on uh, pretty much a similar story for us tonight at the beginning of this newscast. Going to be back in just a couple of seconds with the latest from the campaign trail in just a few seconds. As we reported earlier in this newscast, Andrew Scheer is in B.C. today where he unveiled the Conservatives' campaign platform. Slowing down infrastructure spending is just one part of the party's plan to balance the budget. David Cochran explains how it all breaks down. The morning after the final debate, Andrew Scheer unveiled his plan to pay for his promises and balance the budget. Our Conservative platform is full of real, concrete measures that will help Canadian families save and plan for the future. 
The big ticket items have already been announced, a universal tax cut backed up by a series of tax credits. But now, all the numbers are on the table. We're going to protect core services while we make government more efficient. By 2024, it adds up to more than $49 billion in tax cuts and new spending. To pay for that and balance the books, there's about $67 billion in spending cuts and new revenue. The revenue amounts to nearly $14 billion. Some comes from a new tax on big tech giants, the bulk from a crackdown on tax evasion. The other $53 billion comes from cuts and spending restraint. If we do not get back to a, a responsible plan for treating Canadian taxpayers' dollars wisely, we will see those massive deficits threaten social programs and lead to massive tax hikes. Sheer insists he can save billions each year by revamping federal infrastructure programs and reduce government spending without cutting the overall size of the public service. There's cuts to corporate welfare and foreign aid and liberal programs that subsidize companies to buy electric cars. The Liberals say all of this will lead to slash and burn. And the Liberals again will try to create fear where, where and, and, and division over something that is simply not true. It all comes with a promise that once the budget is balanced, it will stay that way. As Scheer is promising legislation that would tie the salaries of his cabinet ministers to meeting that goal. He'd also make it a rule that every dollar in new government spending has to be matched by a dollar in savings to force future governments to live within their means. David Cochran, CBC News, Delta, British Columbia. And for his part, Liberal leader Justin Trudeau is criticizing Tory leader Andrew Scheer for waiting until now to release his costed platform. Trudeau in Ottawa today before leaving for BC. Conservatives are finally saying that they might release a fully costed platform later today. Listen, the reality is, I think we all know it, you don't release your best work at six o'clock on a Friday of a long weekend. We should note the Conservatives actually released their platform at about 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific, and not 6 p.m., as you heard Trudeau say in that clip. Now, the NDP also released its costed platform this morning with $35 billion in new spending next year. The party says it'll pay for it by increasing taxes on the wealthy and increasing the capital gains tax, which would affect more than just rich Canadians. You know that families need help now? And that's why we put forward some urgent priorities that we would work on right away. That includes investments in housing, in health care, helping students, tackling cell phone prices, and real and urgent action on fighting the climate crisis. There's no plan to balance the books, but after the first year, Singh says his party plans on running deficits, which will be $10 billion lower than the Liberals. So how do the political parties compare when it comes to tackling climate change? The four major federal parties, the Liberals, Conservatives, NDP and Greens, have all spelled out their plans in their campaign platforms. But which one actually gets us to the Paris target? CBC asked an economic modeling firm to project the impact of each party's climate policies. And Peter Armstrong breaks it down. Climate's no longer a fringe issue. It's on the streets, in the boardrooms, and on the campaigns. Right now, Canada emits about 715 megatons a year. The Paris target is to get that down to 511 megatons by 2030. We need radical change. We need deep decarbonization. We need it to start now. We need a full frontal uh, attack on the climate crisis. So we asked the research firm Navius to figure out how close the party's proposals get to that target. Their model gave us these projections. The Liberals, the Conservatives and the NDP all make some progress, but none of them come even close to reaching the Paris targets. With the most aggressive climate policy, the Green Party actually beats the target. But the Green Party's plan would slow the economy by the most as well. The Navius model projects economic growth would average around 1.25% between now and 2030. The NDP, the Liberals and the Conservatives all come in fairly close to one another. Peter Armstrong, CBC News, Toronto. And to read our full comparison of the federal party's carbon strategies, you can go to cbcnews.ca slash carbon platforms. And you can watch more on The National tonight at 10 o'clock on CBC Television. The U.S. decision to suddenly pull out of northern Syria has created a vacuum. 
one Turkey is eager to fill. The latest on an escalating situation in the Middle East coming up. Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. That would be really hard for us, like people who are going for UBC, the schools, it will be really hard. Transit riders in Metro Vancouver worried about possible job action by bus drivers. They voted 99% in favor of a strike mandate. The overall dollar amount is the exact same. There's no reduction in the overall dollar amount. What we're saying is that we are going to make sure that projects actually get built concern the Conservatives promises on infrastructure spending will have an impact on major projects planned for Metro Vancouver. Leader Andrew Scheer announcing the party's fiscal plan in BC this afternoon. If I had it my way I would allow uh, street signs on public property. A new sign bylaw is having an impact on the federal election campaign in Surrey. 
Candidates are having to use new strategies to get their names out there. Well, tonight marks the fifth and final installment of our documentary series, Art is a Story. To cap it off, we explore how contemporary and historical female artists have worked to show a different side to mainstream narratives through art. Our first artist is Parisa Azadi, an Iranian-Canadian who continues to travel back to her native land to tell the story of a past she never knew. I think growing up here, there was always a feeling of fear and shame about being Middle Eastern and Iranian. It was something I felt like I needed to hide. So I think photography was a way to deal with that feeling of displacement. Growing up in Canada, I never had the chance to learn about my own culture and history. You, you don't get the opportunity to learn that in schools. You know, for us, assimilation was a survival tactic. So we had to dress a certain way, talk a certain way in order to survive. So so it was important for me to go back there to find out where I belong after running away for so long. So as an artist who's discovered your own roots, what ultimately do you want someone such as myself, far removed from Iran, to take away from this exhibition and body of work? I wanted to show Iranians in their normal lives and how they cope and adapt to pressure. In general, in the West, where when we hear about Iran, it's always in the context of war and conflict, and we don't see how these things affect people's lives. What I feel right now when I see the images we're seeing in the media, you know, they're usually images of black and brown bodies photographed in vulnerable situation, and the person making those images is m most oftentimes white and male. So it's like you're when you're constantly being bombarded with these types of images, you get this um, one singular narrow view. So it was important for me to show the mundane moments that you would see here in the West. And in a way, someone can connect to that. They could see a piece of themselves in that. And that's, I think, one way where you break down stereotypes. Breaking down stereotypes. That direction of intent is so important today, more than ever. Paul, oh, how was that introduction to Parisa? It was fantastic. It was really interesting to meet somebody who's actively engaged in Iran and creating art from that experience. It was really amazing. Amazing. And now it's my turn to introduce you to somebody. Who's that? Mary Ritter Hamilton. Who's Mary Ritter Hamilton? Well, Mary Ritter Hamilton is an artist that lived in Vancouver, was invited by the War Arms Society to go over the battlefields of Europe after World War I and basically document the aftermath of the war. I've invited Dr. Suzanne Steele to come down. She's a member of the Canadian War Arts Program and worked on the battlefields of Afghanistan and she went over as Canada's first war poet. Her war work is very much alive. There's a painting here of the bunker and you see the razor wire and it's magnificent. We often focus on combat, the, you know, the front lines, but behind everyone at the front lines are dozens if not a couple hundred people supporting them. It's interesting talking to Parisa again and some definite familiarities to the Mary Ritter Hamilton story as what mm -hmm. we've just talked to with Parisa about. For sure, and just that idea of documenting or trying to maybe give a more correct narrative of what is going on. Exactly, a broader narrative. I think this is wonderful that you're paying attention to her now. I just grieve for her that she wouldn't have mm. known this. Mm. Yeah. Mary Rittle Hamilton's story is a great example of bravery, courage, and a sacrifice to create important pieces of art, not for her, but for generations to come. Throughout this series, we've talked a lot about the past, understanding the past, respecting the past, being invested in the past. I know now within my heart how important that is to our culture and country, not only for ourselves, but also for our children and their children to come. The other element of self-discovery I've uncovered in this series is how excited I am about the future and my family's future here in Canada. Thank you so, so much for joining Paul and I on this journey. And fingers crossed we get to share more tales with you on Art is a Story. 6.34, Friday night, there's a live shot from our CBC station in Winnipeg. Yes, that's not a movie set. That's actually snow on the ground in Winnipeg tonight. Thought we'd show you that. And while it was cold here in the Lower Mainland, we don't have that much to complain about, all things considered. The latest from snowy Manitoba and a full look at your weather next.
An early snowstorm is barreling through Manitoba tonight, leaving tens of thousands of people without power. As the CBC's Bartley Kivas reports, the storm is so early this year, most trees are still covered with leaves. This explosion in St. Boniface was caused by a tree heavy with snow. Trees are down all over Winnipeg, landing on cars, blocking streets, and falling on homes. In East Fort Gary, Graham Harrison heard a crash late last night and woke up to find a tree on his property. Now all I'm doing is trying to clear snow off the trees to get the weight off because there's more snow coming. Some of the downed trees took out power lines. As many as 100,000 Manitoba homes were without power at some point, including tens of thousands in Winnipeg. In West Kildonan, Leo Delatra hasn't had power for nearly a day. To be on the safe side, he didn't touch his refrigerator. We haven't opened it. <laughs> so yeah, it was, we, we haven't had breakfast yet, so we just like stayed in bed. Manitoba Hydro says it's working on restoring power for Delatra and thousands of others. We're about to hit the record, the all-time record. Hydro can't say when power will be restored due to the demand. Our customers, we recognize this is inconvenient, but they have to be preparing for an extended outage. The power outages took out many traffic lights in Winnipeg. Today, the city asked drivers to stay off the roads to ensure fire trucks, ambulances, and police cars can get around. Winnipeg's mayor made an unusual plea to businesses today. Some employers may be uh, maybe uh, voluntarily deciding to uh, to close their offices today to allow their staff to uh, to get home early. Um, that's obviously something if it can be accommodated um, would be uh, would be helpful. Manitoba Public Insurance is expecting about 2,000 claims today, which it says is way higher than a normal snowstorm. Oh boy, the CBC's Bartley Kivas reporting from snowy Winnipeg tonight. That looks messy. Yeah, and I think what stands out to me is that that is not the type of snow that's native to the prairies. They get that cold, light, fluffy stuff. Mm. And to see that, those down trees, a lot of people on Twitter saying that in addition to a snow uh, removal device, mm. they need a chainsaw. In yeah, to so that. for those leaf-laden trees. <laughs> yeah. Exactly, the ones yeah. laden trees. <laughs> uh, but no, nothing like that to be worrying about on this side, fortunately, not even up in our mountains. It's actually going to be a very pleasant Thanksgiving weekend. And if you wanted to see a look this morning at some of that beautiful sunshine that we've been treating to over the past couple of days. Well, here it is. And I do want you to take a good look at this because I have a feeling that this upcoming weekend is not going to be nearly as sunny. It will still be a fine weekend, don't get me wrong, but it was such a beautiful day out there. Temperatures getting really close to seasonal, and who can complain about that much sun? But yes, Thanksgiving, the long weekend for many of us, is upon us. And if you're wondering how it's going to play out, well, here's your full forecast. For much of Saturday, we're just looking at a really cloudy day. Temperatures close to seasonal, 13 degrees or so, not really expecting much rain come Sunday another mostly cloudy day and a few sunny breaks are possible and just to add to the mix some places into the Fraser Valley could get a few spotty showers here but as for Thanksgiving again mix of sun and cloud and this is probably if I had to bank on it this is going to be probably the nicest day of the long weekend so no crazy temperature fluctuations and the overnight lows are going to be very close to seasonal now you can see on here the reason why it's a little bit spotty and difficult to tell exactly where this precipitation is coming from is because we don't have a significant system coming on shore throughout the weekend that is going to be the way that we start off the work week coming up to next Tuesday. This is going to be bringing a lot of heavy rain with it by the time that we go back to work at that point. But in the meanwhile, we're just looking at that cloud like I mentioned. Now, in general, temperatures are going to be fairly close to seasonal province-wide. So if you're doing any traveling into the interior, you shouldn't find any difficulties there. And as I mentioned, for a five-day forecast, it's not looking too bad at all. So just that cloud, very, very slight risks for showers on both Saturday and Sunday. Monday, probably the nicest day. And then and yes, I've already used the kind of heavier rain icon for Tuesday, feeling like it's going to be a pretty soggy start to the work week, but mm. there must be a balance in all things. There must be. Mm -hmm. You just <laughs> displayed it right there. See, I yes. tried. Thanks very much. <laughs> You're welcome. Well, a grim scene in suburban Los Angeles. That's where 100,000 have been evacuated as deadly wildfires burn down homes. The latest from L.A. next.
Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. On the coast, Gloria Makarenko returns as host of Splash, Art Umbrella's signature art auction and gala on October 26th. Get your tickets today at artsumbrella.com. And CBC Vancouver's Dan Burt is backed by popular demand at Richmond Hospital Foundation's Starlight Gala on October 19th. For more info and tickets, visit richmondhospitalfoundation.com. And for more, check us out online. Growing concern tonight about Turkey's ongoing offensive against Kurds in northern Syria. With Turkish forces stepping up their assault, the biggest worry at the moment is of a humanitarian disaster as thousands of civilians flee the border area. The CBC's Margaret Evans is in neighboring Iraq tonight with the latest. The Turkish incursion is now in its third day. We are hearing again reports of shelling and of course seeing images of people on the ground trying to get ahead of the fighting to get out of its way. Observers on the ground say they estimate as many as 60,000 people have already been displaced by the fighting or fear of fighting and they're warning or aid agencies are warning that another 450,000 people could be impacted along that border between northern Syria and Turkey within a five kilometer range. I'm speaking to you from northern Iraq where people are bracing themselves for a potential wave of Syrian refugees. It would be another wave of Syrian refugees. They've been hosting them here for years. On the international front, a lot of hand-wringing, but very little impact. Yesterday, the Turkish president was quite defiant, telling European nations to stop calling the incursion an invasion, saying if they didn't, he would unleash millions of Syrian refugees on their doorsteps. In Washington, the tone hasn't really been much better. A defiant U.S. President, Donald Trump, seeming to hint that he might be called upon to mediate between Turkey and the Syrian Kurdish militias, uh, the same militias that he's been accused of abandoning uh, after they fought for so many years alongside U.S. troops to defeat the Islamic State. Nobody seems to know how long the incursion might last. Ankara has said it will not go any deeper than 30 kilometers inside uh, Syria. However, we are hearing that the, the plan is for to that safe zone, what they call a safe zone that they're creating, is supposed to extend all the way to the Iraqi border. Margaret Evans, CBC News, Erbil, northern Iraq. Well, the list of Nobel Peace Prize recipients is long and includes a range of distinguished leaders, from Lester B. Pearson to Mikhail Gorbachev and Nelson Mandela. This year, the 43-year-old Prime Minister of Ethiopia joined its ranks. This is um, a prize given to Africa, given to Ethiopia. So I'm so happy and I'm so thrilled. Nobel Peace Prize winner Abi Ahmed Ali Got word in a phone call from Oslo this morning. The honor is in recognition of his work toward peace and international cooperation in resolving the border crisis between Ethiopia and Eritrea. His determination led to restored relations after two decades of hostilities. Abiy came to office in 2018, bringing in new democratic freedoms and a pledge to improve the lives of the impoverished. Ethiopia has more than 100 million people, more than 40% under the age of 15. Peak wildfire season has suddenly ignited in California, where at least eight fires are raging tonight. But two large ones are causing havoc on the outskirts of Los Angeles. Kim Brunhuber talked to residents trying to prevent the worst. Even in a massive brush fire, this is how homes are saved and lost. In individual battles fought street by street, this fire started just minutes ago, an ember landing on dry grass. Was not what you trained for? <laughs> no, not at all. The fire is so new, this LAPD officer is trying to fight it with a garden hose. Is that having any effect? Not really. So Joe Garcia joins the fight. Every little bit helps, you know. Hoping he can stop the fire before it consumes his neighborhood. Garcia was a Marine who served in Iraq. He takes medication for PTSD and almost didn't get up when the call came to evacuate. Apparently they were knocking and doorbell going off and I couldn't hear anything because of medication and luckily our dog kept barking and woke me up and then we got out. Within minutes from a small brush fire to this. You can see this whole area here 
starting to go up in flames all around me. And it's creeping down the hill. This is happening across a massive area, 30 square kilometers. For some along the fire's path, it's too late. This, one of dozens of homes already lost, its owners too distraught to speak. The fire that burned down this home is still flaring. Another 20 meters and Iyad Jarjur's home would be gone too. It spread so fast. Within seconds, the fire reached your house. When Alan Shanazari fled with his family late last night, the fire was raging just across the road. So when he came back this morning, imagine his shock to find his house still standing. It's a miracle, I guess. But it's not over. <laughs> back in Garcia's neighborhood, reinforcements finally arrive. But with this fire seemingly able to spring up anywhere with no warning, Garcia has to be ready if the wind shifts. No sleep tonight. The long watch, he says, has just begun. Kim Brunhuber, CBC News, Porter Ranch, California. Well, if you're in the market for a loan, a car, or a house, it's easier than ever to check your credit score. So millions are signing up to find out that very important number that could determine whether you get a loan and your interest rate. But can you trust what you're getting? Marketplace put four credit score companies to the test, and the numbers just don't add up. Asha Tomlinson explains. Let's take it back to Vancouver. Business owner Raman Agarwal is taking a risk to learn the truth about credit scores. If uh, your credit score is bad, you may be declined for mortgage, you may be declined for any finances you want to do. That three-digit number can determine if you get financing and at what rate. Credit score crew, how you doing? Great. So Marketplace asked Agarwal and two other Canadians to get their scores from four different websites, Credit Karma, Borrowell, Equifax and TransUnion. 762. Oh, 762 is very good according to Credit Karma. The scores they get online. <gasps> 637, wow, what did I do? Are not the same. Everybody reports different scores, and it doesn't make sense. It's an interesting exercise. So which scores would lenders use? Agarwal brings his numbers to mortgage broker Vince Gitano. I wouldn't rely on these. This is a client score. As a mortgage professional, I pull yes. a beacon score. The beacon score is used by most lenders in Canada, but it's kept secret from consumers, unless you ask for it. And if you do, it could lower your score. So why don't we come on in? Agarwal wanted to take the risk. Your beacon score is a lot different than any of those four reports you showed me today. Let me ask you, is it higher or lower? It's extremely higher. Your credit score is 829. Oh my God. That's almost 200 points higher than his lowest number, given out by Canadian company Borowell. We asked the CEO why. So there are many different types of credit score in Canada um, and different and they're calculated slightly differently. It is a complicated system and I'm we're the first to say that it's frustrating for consumers. We didn't build the system. We're trying to help add transparency to it and help consumers navigate it. That's not good enough for Agarwal. Whatever your score is, there should be one score. All four companies say the scores they give consumers are used by lenders. But check out the fine print. It says these scores may not actually be used by your lender and therefore educational use. Asha Tomlinson, CBC News, Toronto. And there's lots more on this story. Catch the full Marketplace investigation tonight, 8 o'clock on CBC Television, or you can stream it anytime on CBC Gem. Well, it doesn't just feature Will Smith. It features two Will Smiths, the original, and a technologically created younger version. So does the gimmick make it a good film? Our Eli Glasner has his review of Gemini next.
Action hero Will Smith faces off against himself in Gemini Man, a new movie set in a future world where cloning is common. Yeah, well, this thriller is loaded with eye-popping technology, but beyond the tricks, is it actually a good film? Eli Glasner has his review. The story begins with Henry Brogan. He's a covert operative who works for the DIA, the Defense Intelligence Agency. They're just like the CIA, but vaguer. Henry's the best of the best, but his last job weighs heavily on him. He says his soul hurts, so he's going to retire. But then someone starts coming after him, someone almost as good as him. Who are you? I don't want to shoot you. So slowly, Henry realizes the guy matching him blow for blow, shot for shot, is a younger copy created to replace him. He chose me because there's never been anybody like me, and he knew one day I was going to get old and then you'd step in. He's been lying to you the whole time. Now, the film comes from director Ang Lee, who enjoys pushing the technological envelope. For Gemini Man, Will Smith played both parts, old Henry and the younger version named Junior. Using motion capture technology, artists created a new digital, younger Will Smith. On top of the digital de-aging, though, Gemini Man is offering another gimmick. The movie was filmed in 3D at 120 frames per second. In Canada, some theaters are offering it in 3D at 60 frames a second, over twice the normal amount. Now, I've seen it, and it is stunning. Crystal clear, crisp, it's like the world's sharpest HD demo video, which just doesn't look like a movie. But Ang Lee believes this is the future. In a world of streaming and giant screen TVs, he wants to give you a reason to go to the theater, something you can't get at home. Now, the story of Gemini Man has been kicking around Hollywood for decades. The screenplay first bubbled up in 1997. Finally, the technology has matured to do the story justice. It's too bad they left that screenplay in a time capsule. The movie feels like an action throwback from the late 90s. First, you have Will Smith doing his stoic, I don't need to make you laugh thing. And then there's Clive Owen as the military mastermind. Now, I like Clive Owen. I've missed Clive Owen, but here he's a walking plot device. He's smug, personified, a living scowl who happens to be Junior's father figure. He has to die. He's your darkness. You had to walk through this on your own. I love you, Junior. Not all the high-tech trickery in the world can save you from dialogue like that. Two and a half stars out of five. You like Glaster, CBC News, Toronto. Well. Eye candy. I mean, if you're in it for that, that feels like it could be a good yes, use. Yes, it does look good. Clive Owen, yes, huge well, fan, of course, and Will Smith too. Yeah. So maybe that's reasonable. <laughs> there you go. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to leave you tonight with some photos from well this year's cranberry harvest in Langley. Some of these very well might end up on your dinner table this weekend for the Thanksgiving festivities. Oh yes, they will. Got to have the cranberry. Oh yeah. And you can always find our news program online, cbc.ca slash bc. Our next local news, Mr. Dan Burrett is here at 11 o'clock right after the National. Have a great Thanksgiving weekend. Good night.